welcome to this edition of the Boot Two Buddies podcast, featuring our discussion of the AMC show Preacher. I'm Adam Foxman, this is Mathis Coos, and you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Reddit. We'd love to field any questions, comments, and concerns, and uh, please rate us on iTunes as well. This is the number one way that you can support our show, and we would really appreciate it. How you doing tonight, Mathis? I'm doing fan fucking tastic. How are you doing? Pretty good, pretty good. Whoop whoop. Nice. Uh, so as always, we will have links to the uh, preacher comics themselves, which are fantastic, and I highly recommend uh, in the description of every episode. So if you're gonna buy them anyway, please buy them through those links. It's just another way to support us. Um, yeah. So let's kick things off. All right, let's tackle this bitch. We start off exactly where the last episode ended. So. Uh, this is uh, episode 106, so episode 7, entitled He Gone, and uh, basically it starts off exactly where the last one ended, which is uh, where Jesse had sent Eugene to hell. Yeah. Uh, a lot so of, they're still in the church here. Yeah, some crazy stuff's happened. I mean, our space is in hell, uh, and Tulip and Cassidy have fucked, so it's kind of like a whole new world right now. A whole new world. Where Cassidy no. and Tulip hook up. <laughs> it's good, right? Okay. Yeah, right. thank you for not leaving me hanging. I, okay. was, I was feeling very vulnerable there for a second. I just had to figure out what to say. All right, moving on, moving on. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, let's get past it. Edit that out, edit that out. Uh-huh. So Jesse is kind of like, fuck, I sent our face to hell. You know, and then we see Cassidy is up above watching. But at the same time, he, you know, kind of like we mentioned last episode, he doesn't seem so distraught either. No, it's kind of just like, eh, you know, onwards and upwards. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like stepping in, uh, it's probably not as extreme, but it's kind of like stepping in shit, like, ah, oh, that, that sucks. Yeah, you, you wipe it off and you move on. Yeah, yeah, um, that's a little more work, you would have put more effort into that. Yeah, so, uh, but while this is happening, uh, and, you know, he, because Jesse opens up the door to, to address the congregation, but as he's doing that, the camera pans up a little bit and you see... Cassidy on the balcony up top and he just witnessed this entire thing basically having gone down yeah and uh being that Cassidy has kind of increasingly become the voice of reason when it comes to genesis and responsibility and is it too powerful um you're kind of expecting it won't end well and they're gonna have words yes which certainly they do and we'll get to that here in a minute but uh so Jesse's outside now uh delivering his sermon to what is a packed house out there? Yeah, the congregation fills up. And there's a couple of different little things going on here. So, like, Sheriff Root uh, looks at the empty seat next to him that he had saved for Eugene. So, you know, he's obviously already noticing uh, that, that he's not there with them. Mm-hmm. And uh, Jesse's given his sermon, uh, tells the congregation that their whole life will change in this moment. And he commands them to serve God. Yep. Uh, so it's kind of crazy that he's, you know, doing this whole, his whole plan. He's kind of trying to come to fruition where he's just going to make people serve God when we know, uh, you know, we just know it doesn't work quite right because of what Ken Ken's done, but obviously Jesse doesn't know this. And, um, I I actually took these notes, I think last week, but I had a little note that says, uh, I found the sermon very unrealistic because there's not a single person playing Pokemon Go. (laughs) <laughs> uh, well, you know, you got my attention the moment you start talking about Pokemon Go, but let's, <laughs> let's not get off topic here, because you know I could talk all day long about how I finally have all my evolutions of the Eevee, but, you know, we'll, we'll save that for another podcast. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, anyway, uh, after this, uh, the sermon's done and they're wrapping up the service, Sheriff Root's asking all the different congregants... If any of them have seen Eugene, but no one has. Yeah, no one's seen Eugene. Um, so, obviously, Jesse understands that everyone's going to be looking at him at this point. But, at the same time, he doesn't seem seem that upset, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's he basically... He walks back in. Yeah, he, he really, truly does... And honestly, it's it's the first time that you're starting because you've already gotten little glimpses of jesse where you realize that he's not just a good guy who's put in a bad situation or anything like that this is the first time where you start to see like uh, there are shades of 
of him being a piece of shit. <laughs> at least, yeah, at least it, little bits of it in there. Well, yeah, and so they'll get into a little more uh, explanation later. But I did find kind of a nice thing they do um, before they roll the credits is they pan to the floorboard. You're not sure if they're yes. going to actually go to hell and see him there. You don't. Instead, it cuts to you know war is hell. So it's actually. King Cannon finishing his Civil War diorama and just the horrors of hell uh, through little figures, and then it it gives us uh, the the credits. Yeah, we'll we'll get to that here in a little bit because the end of this episode was really great. Yes. Um, but l- let's start off. Uh, actually, rewind it way back, which is there are a ton of flashbacks in this episode, so I want to kind of go through some of them real quick because a lot of them are nice stage setting uh, moments where you kind of get. Mm-hmm. Uh, a little bit of young Jesse and young Tulip, uh, which we now know definitely 100%. It because we had talked about that. I, I had mentioned that I thought that that was a young Tulip. Um, it's not, you know, something that you have to guess about anymore. This is clearly a young Tulip. Um, the first one, they're sitting outside the principal's office, and John Custer and the principal are admonishing them for beating up three kids. One of them, which by the way, is actually Donnie. Uh, and, and one of them lost a nipple, which I'm wondering, is is it Donnie? And is that where, uh, I don't know, all the pain fetish comes from? Oh, that, that huh? there could be some something to that. Right, because they'd have the offhand remark that one of them lost a nipple, which is funny in, in and of itself. But the fact that one of them's Donnie, and, you know, we know what that relationship's like. Huh? Huh? Wow, huh? very interesting, man. I, I did not catch that, but... um. So, yeah, I mean, Jesse insists that they were being bullied, and uh, they, he begs John to take uh, Tulip home with them since her mother's in jail and her, her uncle is a drunk, which we certainly know from the current scenes going on, too. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <it's just laughs> sleeping all over town. Yeah, not much has changed there. Um, but then, so that night, Tulip sleeps in the Custer living room, and uh, in his prayers, young Jesse is thanking God for uh, for making John, which is his father, do the right thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, and I will say, this is another area where really drastically just uh, separates from the comic, only because Tulip uh, and Jesse, there's definitely plenty of Jesse's childhood and his history in the comics, but uh, Tulip is definitely a later part of his life, so um, it, it's not something I mind, only because also, if it's done right, it opens up a whole bunch of backstory and stuff that, you know, otherwise we wouldn't know. So it kind of keeps us in suspense. Tulip in general is probably one of the biggest departures from uh, from the the comic. I mean, starting off with the most basic thing that she, Just how she looks, looks nothing yeah. like her. Um, sure. And, and I actually love the casting of this, this lady as Tulip. She does, I think, a fantastic job. They're not always so far in this season the most intriguing plot sure. lines for her um but the way she acts in them is really great and the way she handles the badass scenes like some of the ones we yeah. saw with uh you know uh, her driving and fighting the guys i mean she she's got some really good sass to her i, I do like her character quite yeah a bit. I, I really like her as an actress um i like her her southern accent like i think she does a, a great job of kind of pulling off the you know, sexy, cute accent, but also kind of just being a badass. Uh, I just don't think that the material they've given her for the season has been the strongest. I think that's the character that they've downplayed because it's been so much about pining for Jesse uh, and the Carlo stuff. Um, and I don't know, maybe almost if they had let us on earlier that there was uh, a relationship that goes this far back, you would understand her persistence and the fact that she doesn't want to let it go instead of it just being you know a breakup from a few years ago, which is what I was thinking. Well, there is the other flashback in this that gives even more uh, illumination to what uh, what has gone on in their past. And in this one, uh, Jesse and Tulip, yeah, a, you know, younger version of them, uh-huh. they're wrestling in the Custer living room, or maybe it's the church room. Either way, uh, John orders them to clean up the dishes, and uh, they, they end up uh, hearing... John talking on the phone, John being the father, and uh, basically uh, there's this nice little moment of young Tulip crawling into Jesse's bed and saying, till the end of the world, right? And uh, he says, till the end of the world. But the next day, the Department of Human Services comes and picks up Tulip, and 
uh, Jesse is just absolutely flipping fucking mad. And, sure. Uh, and he's you know he's asking his dad that that preacher why why he's sending Tulip away. She's you know she's been on her best behavior this and that. And uh, John Custer says something that seems out of character with the pious always do right you know no judging sort of thing because she's an o'hare yeah and they're Mm -hmm. always going to be trouble and uh i thought that was kind of fucked up but so anyway he ends up you know chase chasing the car down the driveway uh and you know it's just it is a sad moment but then there is this part where he is praying to god and his dad dies Yeah. yeah please please kill my dad kill him and send him straight to hell he says yeah, uh, th- th- these scenes are, are fairly effective. The Till the End of the World line um, is, is from the comic as well, and they use it to emotional impact there too. So they're, they're doing a good job kind of taking material and, and mingling it together and trying to kind of find a happy medium as they're obviously going to explore a lot of new places that the, that the comic didn't. So I really liked all these scenes, and you're starting to get some context, and I'm starting to feel a little more and like Tulip's character more just because you're starting to understand maybe why she was so attached. There was a bit of a funny slash sad moment. It's actually Tulip in the present and it goes back to her drunk uncle Walter Uh uh, where it actually comes right out of one of these different flashbacks. I don't remember which one, but uh, she's chasing a kid down and forces him to hand over a pair of pants and walks (laughs) back and it was Uncle Walter passed out on the front stoop pantsless uh, this kid's running away with him so she's like you know trying to get him up to get his pants on and stuff and you can see all the neighbors looking over like and completely disapproving i like that they had the mascot walking by as well which you've seen uh in so many different random you know the uh, the one random character was her drunken uncle but now they've provided context so it's a little more than that but they still have this mascot just walking around the, the city which presumably this is like what, like 8 a.m. or something like yeah, that? Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> early in the morning. <laughs> and it's full regalia. Literally, you can see him shaking his head, like, you know, in disgust at what they're doing as he's walking around in full character at, you know, at 7, 8 a.m. Obviously, you don't understand uh, the dedication to local sports this man has. I guess that's true. I, I never watch Friday Night Lights, so maybe I just don't understand the, the, the cult of Texas football. Yeah, it's a it's a crazy crazy cult you know nothing about that you know nope. nothing Mathis snow um, <laughs> so uh the, another thing that's going on here is uh emily is directing a church play which i thought was pretty funny and uh she ends up asking jesse for feedback and he is a complete dick i felt like to these poor actors like telling them to stop smiling you need to look more terrified uh you recall this part yeah, I mean, he, he's casting director, um, but he's obviously in a very dark frame of mind. The stuff that he's been through with his powers and just been exposed to, um, and his journey to redemption, which is a solid one and obviously doesn't feel or look like redemption to us, um, these you know, kid actors, these amateur actors are not leaving up, leading up to what he would like it to express. Uh, but he's just a jerk about it. He's an asshole. He doesn't um approach it the right way obviously he definitely does not especially you know he's supposed to be really bringing the community together it's his whole purpose here is that that's what he wants to do but i mean in his dealings with people he's either um what's that, hypnotizing them uh however you want to put it into uh-huh. into basically obeying his will or he's just being a complete fucking asshole to them. So uh, I just, it, it, it's kind of funny that he, that these are his noble aspirations, but in none of his day-to-day dealings is he really living up to that at all. No. Um, and there are some interesting, a funny moment like when Cass and, um, or Cassidy and Preacher are talking about Arceus being damned to hell, like, uh, Cassidy calls him the arse face kid and he's just like you don't want to help he pretends it's not a big deal and then he just immediately goes off to Emily so you're just seeing you know all these different moments where it should be weighing on him and maybe him being an asshole is it weighing on him uh, but you really don't feel for him at this point you're, you're like he's almost a pseudo villain right now he, he is throughout this episode and 
uh, more and more uh, it makes you wonder if uh, if Genesis is somehow, and I think the term I used for it last episode is kind of poisoning the well and sort of getting him punch drunk on the power that he's now got through it. Um, because, I mean, even though he is certainly not the most pious preacher or inspired one in the beginning, there's nothing happening that makes you think that his actual true character is this dark and flawed and shitty. Um, so, you, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of wondering if maybe this power that he's been imbued with is starting to taint him a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to see if that's the approach they take. Um, you know, I, I don't know. It's it's very much not that way uh, in the comics, but I, I don't know. Like, it, This is kind of outside of that realm. It's supposed to lead up to that. So yeah, I wonder if I they're just see. trying to humanize him and try to get us to a point where we see the best and the worst of him before we maybe go on whatever journey so yeah yeah i mean i just think that as we're watching it it's certainly worth uh i don't know maybe throwing ideas out there for how things are going to progress but Mm -hmm. yeah at this point we have nothing to indicate whether or not he is being sort of controlled a little bit by genesis or anything so snapping back to where we were in the present kin cannon ends up stopping by and asked to speak with jesse in private um, it, why don't you go ahead and take the lead on this scene where he's trying to get him to sign the deed and transfer the church? Yeah, so um, Ken Cannon comes in, and uh, you know he lets first thing he talks about is that he's finished the Civil War model, which we saw earlier, um, and he kind of has this uh, monologue about letting his family down, letting the family business dwindle, uh, and he gives kind of some numbers, but essentially what he does in a year you know, at a time his family did in a month and that he's kind of let it fall apart. Yeah, he even says, like, his great-granddaddy did it in a week. Yeah, in a week, yeah. So he kind of goes back to... Which, when if you adjust for inflation, that's really bad. Yeah, it's it's absolutely terrible. It's an, an economic nightmare, right? So the heartland is hurting, and his point essentially is he's leading up to go ahead and sign this deed over because, you know, I'm running a business. Um yeah, which, it, by the way, is a real shock because at no point in the things that he's talking about do, do you, you feel think like that that's, that's what he's angling. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he's. it feels like he's coming to the preacher and actually confessing because as far as yeah. we know, he is a devout Christian at this point because he has been commanded by the word of Genesis to serve God. So the last thing you expect is he's going to pull this deed out. So it, it takes you aback. It takes Jesse aback. Um, and, you know, they talk about the deal they made. And the deal was that you come to service and you'll want to serve God and, and be a Christian. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, Jesse still wins, even if the caveat is that, you know, a week later he's back to his old ways and is no longer believing. In that moment, what the bet was, he still won. But needless to say, Jesse isn't having it, uh, gives him a hard time, and... He doesn't I mean, really argue his point particularly well either. Like, no, it, I feel like if, if I feel like he me, should have really argued the point, I would have been like, no, this is the contract we signed or, or talked about verbally. You showed up to church. Everyone saw it. I have a hundred fucking witnesses. Fuck off. But he's just like, yeah, I'm not giving it to a, a kin cannon. He makes I it just, feel like there are very few moments in life where being litigious is an admirable quality, but it was certainly called for in this moment. <laughs> Yeah, just to be like, well, here's the soundness from a legal standpoint, and you should <laughs> yeah. back the fuck off, you know? Yeah, I yeah. mean, because he's basically just like, well, I'm not doing it. <laughs> yeah. Like, Come yeah. on, dude, yeah. don't be I'm obstinate. a stubborn like... Texan, so go fuck yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was which, the... you know, Ken Cannon basically vows to return, and then uh, wasn't there some line that he quoted or something along the lines of, you know, reaping what you sow or bringing punishment or something like that? Uh, or to summarize via my notes, Quinn Cannon versus Preacher. And I keep saying Quinn <laughs> Cannon because of the fucking cue, but it's Ken Cannon versus Preacher, three exclamation points, ding, 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 first round. Nice, nice, nice. Uh, I love your notes, by the way. Uh, I mean, I- I'm sad that we're not getting any more villain cocks, uh, but but I, I am liking the, the little shorthand stuff. Yeah, you're getting enough villain cock outside of the podcast, you know what I'm saying? Hey, hey. <laughs> Oh man, uh, I missed it obviously. But here, it's coming. It's coming way too late. But it's gonna come either way. You ready for this? Yeah. Oh no! Oh no! 
Uh, it's taking too long. <laughs> and it Whatever's work. happening it feels it. like a big time swing and a mess. <laughs> it was absolutely the worst. I, I went to the trouble of, it'll probably work now. It's not worth it. <laughs> I downloaded a little soundboard out of my phone. And uh, then I had to open my phone, take it off mute, turn it up, and find it. God damn it. Oh, man. I can't imagine that <laughs> having gone more poorly. <laughs> Way to get it in the flow of things there, buddy. Uh, at least you got to hear me like just do a, a gut laugh. Right. Oh, whew. yeah, that was uh, that, that was <laughs> well worth it. Definitely don't edit that out. No, I won't. It's perfect. Between that and a whole new world being sung, we are <laughs> off to a rocky start here, man. So let's get back on track. All right. So All I right. think Cass and Emily are outside talking. Is that where we're at? Yeah, well, they end up talking. He tells her that Jesse, you know, actually is a good guy because she's saying she feels now like I don't even really know him. Mm-hmm. There's not really much else that happens in that scene, so yeah, I kind of want to skip forward a little bit. Din- uh, dinner. Where they're in the church kitchen, and that's when Cassidy confronts Jesse about Eugene's disappearance. Uh, and Jesse just, you know, really just kind of blows him off a little bit. And uh, Tulip ends up walking in with groceries, mm-hmm. and Cassidy tells her that he hasn't told Jesse about the fling and kind of questions, uh, I don't know, how committed Jesse is to her. And then Tulip gets all defensive and dares Cassidy to tell Jesse he is a vampire because she figures that, you know, Preacher definitely isn't going to be supportive of all that stuff. Sure, sure. Uh, The other thing that's great is as they kind of go back and forth, you know, whose favorite is he? Um... She's like, well, well, what actor does Jesse think shits, uh, shits sunshine? In which he gets it wrong, and it's John Wayne. And I was just like, oh, I guess they threw something in there, John Wayne, because we talked about that a few episodes past where that's just his conscience. That's who he talks to throughout the comic. That is true. Um, and I, I do like that they, at the very least, have some some bit of it. It seems like even things that they're not going big into. And actually... It is totally possible if uh, if this is all kind of the prequel stuff. It is totally possible sure. that eventually we we will have like a live action John Wayne. Character <laughs> yeah, on if, the show. if maybe Jesse has like a total psychotic break at some point, it's just like he's got to start talking. He's to not his that childhood far friend. from one now, don't you? No, think? I mean it's it's very much leading to it. Like for all I know, the cliffhanger of the final episode is that he's going to talk to to John Wayne. That and, would be, and everyone's gonna be like, cool. "What the fuck kind of cliffhanger is that?" So yeah. I, I don't suggest they do that, but it might be. Hmm, okay, um, so you know, the, the, she had the groceries, uh, uh, which leads to you know they cook dinner. Uh, Jesse, Tulip, uh, Cassidy, and Emily are all eating dinner together, and Jesse is just sitting there in like this sulking, sullen silence as Cassidy is just kind of chattering on idly about all sorts of different things and uh sheriff rude ends up stopping by to ask if they've seen eugene yeah and, and no one has seen him at this point um i'm trying to vac- see exactly well, where this is it in it well but. yeah jesse uh jesse denies seeing him but emily actually reminds jesse that's that who she was, sent yeah. eugene in to speak with him that morning Yes, that's right. So there's that awkward moment because he essentially says, no, I haven't seen him. She's like, well, no, he, he came in this morning. He's like, oh, that's right. We talked for a few minutes. But then Emily, you know, luckily backs him up. It's like, but I also saw him leave. And, you know, it jogs his memory, but and, and Root's at least not suspicious at this point. She kind of covers for him. Yes. So then Jesse walks Sheriff Root out to the car, sees him off, and, uh, Cassidy and he end up having uh, another back and forth right here. And then this is actually where we finally get um, Eugene's whole backstory and his connection to Tracy Loach. Um, you're recalling that scene? Yeah, so this is where you're finally uh, clued into what exactly happened. Uh, and this is where, you know, Jesse's indifference, although. You know, as as a third party watching, it doesn't necessarily feel justified, but you at least understand where he's coming from. You know, he basically. But it also says, doesn't feel justified because he's treated him with such humanity and kindness. the whole time. Yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's uncharacteristic. It's but, abrupt. Yeah, exactly. It's an abrupt change in his perspective, regardless. But he has this moment where he essentially says, like, you know, Ars face or, or Eugene is not a saint. Um, you know, he was into this girl, didn't want to take him to prom. 
And so he got a shotgun out, took her out, then took himself out, but they both survived, essentially. That's, yeah, that's exactly what happened. So he's really justifying his actions. And I think he says something to the extent of better men than Eugene have gone to hell. And, uh, and Cassidy points out, like, you know, you're no saint yourself, Padre. And uh, the, what ends up happening is pretty crazy. He, he First off, he throws the fire extinguisher at Jesse. Yeah, he hits uh, him with the fire extinguisher. He's like, tell me more about him, like, to, to kind of lead into it. Yeah. Uh, do you want to talk about the uh, reverse photosynthesis emulsion moment? The what? <laughs> I guess I used a lot of unnecessarily big words right there, but where he basically erupts into flames because he steps into the light. Oh, yeah, yeah, the spontaneous combustion. Yeah, he really pushes uh, against Jesse and, and essentially saying, if you don't care, like, well, you know, then I'm going to make you care. You care about me, right? And so he walks out of uh, the shade of the church and walks into the sun, just starts, you know, bursting into flame. You start to see his back boiling and the flames coming up, and it's a um, pretty effective scene, pretty fucked up. It is, but we don't get to see what Preacher ends up doing with him because it cuts away, and it's Jesse marching back into the kitchen, and he angrily realizes that Tulip already kind of knew what was going on with Cassidy, that he's a vampire, basically. Uh-huh. And Tulip want, is like demanding to know what Jesse did to him, and uh, yeah, I mean he is just going full on douche mode at this point. He's he sneers at her, you know, for being an O'Hare with her low standards, and she ends up storming out. Um, Emily, uh, you know, is just sitting there saying that like she believed in him from day one, and he's like, "Well, that was stupid," mm-hmm. and just being, I mean, a complete dick. Yeah, he is being incredibly douchey and incredibly unlikable. He's obviously just like super pissed at the world. He doesn't take any blame for you know anything that's gone on, even though the fact that he you know damned Eugene to hell. Um, it, he's he's in a dark place. You don't like him by the end of this episode. You don't like him by the end of last episode yeah uh, and this is really a continuation of that of that change in him which is why i continue mentioning the part about how i'm wondering if if it's all sort of tied into something where he's not in total control of his emotions or uh, i don't know his levels of irritability or something because Mm -hmm. uh, it just it, it does seem sudden because while he was never a saint before uh he never seemed so completely self-absorbed that he didn't care if you know this kid went to hell or if Cassidy's burning outside uh yeah this is a a new version of Preacher and one that you really don't like to see as your protagonist sure and 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 Cassidy does challenge him it's not like he just has any unsound arguments I mean I think one of the things he says is like he's like look Jesse I hate God I think God smells like farts he's arrogant why don't you know, like why aren't you damning me to hell right so he's really pushing his buttons you know before he bursts himself into flames and it, it just doesn't seem like anything's getting through to Jesse right now true and uh, uh let me go to this last flashback that he ends up having uh which is where his father, uh, John, rushes into the bedroom where young Jesse's sleeping and uh, like quickly tells him to get under your bed, get under your bed. Uh, so he does, and so from under the bed, uh, a terrified Jesse is watching as a group of men come in and beat his father senseless. And uh, that's where we get the scene that leads up to this moment that we've seen several times throughout the show yeah, of his uh, father. Jesse's father uh, meeting his maker. Yeah, so you, you kind of get finally get the context that we've been seeing where you know he, his father gets shot. Um, you know, and, and that's the other thing you always consider is like, obviously, if he watched his father get shot, he's got some baggage, yet he seemed to keep it mostly under control through most of the, the series, yet he obviously is getting to you know, a, a breaking point here, you know? Yes, uh, and clearly, and especially when you see how the moment played out, um, because, uh, you know, they're dragged outside, uh, he is being held, his father is being held at gunpoint, while Jesse is being forced to watch, um, and, you know, he's telling him, be strong, you know, we don't cry, and then Jesse says, you know, this is all my fault, I prayed for this, and the moment that he lets that line out uh, is when the man, you know, basically blows his brains out of his eardrum 
yeah, so he, he gets brutally murdered, you know, execution style in front of him. But the uh, be one of the good guys because there are way too many of the bad, you know, and don't cry. You know, those are all, um, you know, these words of wisdom to live by, which, uh, uh, you know, oddly enough are, are things that John Wayne, the comic, holds him accountable for. So it's it's nice that they're starting to introduce these elements that he's supposed to live up to. And I think that's important in this episode because I think ultimately what it's trying to, to illustrate is the fact that he is, in this episode, very much kind of becoming the bad guy. So how does he move past that? and still honor his father, whatever the hell ended up happening there. Well, strengthening your point that you're bringing up, too, is that as it comes out of this reverie or, uh, you know, look at his past, whatever you want to call it, uh, this is the scene that we talked about earlier in, in this episode where Jesse's ripping up the church floorboard in the spot where Eugene disappeared, screaming, come back. Oh, that's right. Yeah, he's digging into there. and Yeah, yeah this, this is the moment that happened. So it's it's exactly what you're saying of, like, He's realizing, like, I am becoming one of the bad guys. Yeah, so he doesn't know what the hell to do about Eugene at this point. Because, I mean, the, the, the power he has, it seems to only work if you tell someone to do something. So, you know, he'd have to get God in front of him, I guess, or the devil, and tell them to, to release Eugene for it to do any good. Yeah, it, that, that's basically exactly what is happening there. So... Uh, during while this is happening, uh, something quite interesting is happening outside, and <laughs> this is the best part. You see a, a line of men marching. I mean, oh, dozens and dozens and dozens of men. Uh, a huge uh, bulldozer is coming through. Kin Cannon is there, and then my fucking favorite part <laughs> is, the, <laughs> is Donnie. The Donnie is marching up in full-on... <laughs> Uh, Confederate Army Civil War regalia. Yeah, he's got his, his regalia on. He's dressed to the nines as, you know, if he was a, a Southern soldier. And yeah, just, they kind of tie enough together because you've seen Donnie in the very first episode being part of a Civil War reenactment and Ken Cannon is doing a Civil War model. I mean, it's in fucking Texas. They want to secede half the time. They're really driving the point home that uh, this is very much part of, of their culture. Uh, and they're at this point just coming to take Jesse's land, regardless of what you know contract did or did not exist. Yes, yeah, so that is where this episode leaves off, and it's a fucking fantastic cliffhanger. Yeah. Um, and Definitely. honestly, we're recording this Sunday night, and based on what time we started, I know that you have not seen the new episode either. This is this new episode that's about to play that we'll end up watching. I will watch it tonight. Is this the next episode, right? Uh, I believe so, because I think this is seven. I think that caught us up last week, so tonight should be the eighth episode, or 1.07. Okay, uh, fantastic. Yeah, so I'm pretty excited to see what happens. Hell yes. Oh my god, because this was really a great cliffhanger. Um, a, a real, like, hell yes type moment, you know? Uh -huh. like. Uh, so I, I cannot wait to see what's going to transpire next. And uh, while we're talking about that, uh, I guess you and I are probably getting back together to record midweek, so uh, we will be totally current then on Preacher. That should release by, what, Thursday probably? Yeah, we'll, we'll Maybe have to Friday at look at schedules, but by the end of the week you should see our next podcast for both uh, Stranger Things and Preacher. And then, you know, going forward, you're, you're going to have a podcast pretty quickly after the release of the new episode, so it'll be nice to tie off the season with, with everyone. We've been building up to it, and it's been a, a perfect show to start off our our, uh, our podcast with. I think we it, both love it. Yeah, it really has been. It's exciting. It's fun. A lot to talk about with mm -hmm. it. Um, do you know how many episodes remain? Uh, I know the last one is on the 31st. I think it's a... Is that a 13... Ep no, it can't be a 13-episode season, but the 31st, so... Not next week. So next week's is the penultimate episode. Yeah, then the week then after the will be the final. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's cool. All right, very good. So we will be, uh, we will, yeah, we'll be releasing uh, episode 107, which is the eighth episode, later this week. Uh, we should be able to release the, the next one basically later that night after it comes out. If not, then the next day. 
Um, so, and then from there on, we'll be current. But yeah, if you're listening to this and uh, you're also watching the uh, Netflix original show, Stranger Things, uh, I would definitely recommend that you check out our podcast on that as well. Yeah, absolutely. We're having a lot of fun with that. Uh, as of this taping, we're two episodes in, but both have been absolutely fucking fantastic and we love it. Um, so if you have Netflix, you know, start watching and, and start listening. And uh, other than that, we'll see you next time, little buddies.